Hey there. My name is Mary Mitchell, and this is part two of a video series that I am doing about my latest genealogical project. Instead of researching an ancestor, this time I'm researching a wooden box. This wooden box. It was built during the 1600s and often called a coffer, which was a strong box that was meant to contain valuables. I inherited this box from my mom, Eileen Mary Hopkins, and she inherited this box from her grandfather, Charles Harris Hopkins. And Charles Harris Hopkins brought this chest with him from Maine when he moved here during the gold rush. In the last video, I showed you the four different ways that Charles Harris Hopkins descended from the Mayflower passenger, Stephen Hopkins. But Charles had a whole cluster of pilgrim ancestors. So there are 21 other possibilities for who might have brought this chest. It's most likely it was handed down through a male line, which would point to Stephen Hopkins. But there are some other possibilities. So in this video, I'm going to introduce you to those people. And I'm hopefully going to answer another question. A lot of people ask me, how come you have so many Mayflower ancestors? And the reason is they all moved to New England between 1620 and 1650. This cluster, my ancestors, settled on Cape Cod and they stayed there for 180 years and intermarried, the same families. So there's all sorts of cousins marrying all sorts of cousins. They didn't go to Maine until 1802. Two couples, the resulting two couples, went to Maine, and those are Charles Harris Hopkins' grandparents. Okay, here we go. I hope you enjoy this. This is a chart I made back in 2005 showing the Mayflower passengers. About one out of every four was under the age of 17. Those with circles around their heads are my direct ancestors. This chart shows how many survived the first winter. Elizabeth Tilly at the bottom lost both her parents. I created this timeline to show you some of the ships I will be talking about. With the exception of the Mayflower, ships would leave England in the spring, arrive in America in June or July, and the passengers would find a place to live before fall. The ships could return to England before the rivers froze over. The first is the Mayflower that arrived in November 1620. But as many of you know, some 30 to 50 of those passengers had sailed from Leyden, Holland, and about 250 of the group that had collected there of separatists were still waiting to join them in America. As you will see, many of them were wives and children of the men who sailed on the Mayflower. In 1621, the company that owned Plymouth sent the Fortune, which carried 30 young men to help build the settlement. Just a few of those men were from Leyden. In 1622, the company bought another ship called the Paragon. Captain William Pierce was the master. A hundred some Leyden passengers got on board. Pierce tried twice to sail across the Atlantic. Each time he ran into storms. The second storm trashed the ship. Finally, in the spring of 1623, 90 of those passengers were transferred to the Anne. She sailed to Plymouth with a small fishing ship called the James. A few of those fishermen would become permanent colony residents. In 1624, a ship called the Charity arrived. It would belong to another colony. It did not carry any laden passengers. The next year, the Jacob arrived. It was also a supply ship, but several laden passengers were on it, including two of my ancestors. But that year, King Charles declared war with France and Spain, and he called all ships to come work for him. There would be no more passenger ships to Plymouth Colony until that ended in 1629. Finally, the little Mayflower of Yarmouth sailed with about 90 laden people, and the handmaid carried another 60. By that time, the group in Leyden had disbanded. 
the ships on the bottom of this chart were involved in establishing the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Winthrop's fleet arrived in 1630. Now let me introduce you to my ancestors, and I'm sorry I had to change speakers in the middle of this project. Stephen Hopkins was from Hampshire, England. In 1620, he sailed to Plymouth on the Mayflower with his second wife, Elizabeth, his son, Giles, and his daughters, Constance and Damaris. Mid-Atlantic, Elizabeth gave birth to a son they named Oceanus. The ship made land at Cape Cod in November. Eighteen years later, on August 7, 1638, Plymouth Colony granted Stephen and Giles the first plot of land in today's Yarmouth on Cape Cod, where they built the first English-built home on the Cape. The Hopkins family would have moved the chest from Plymouth to Yarmouth in 1638. Next, we have Giles's father-in-law. Gabriel Weldon emigrated from the county of Nottingham to Dedham in the Massachusetts Bay Colony before 1638. He had at least seven children, three died young. He had a wife named Jane, but there is no proof she was the mother of his children. On September 3, 1638, Plymouth Colony awarded him the second grant of land in Yarmouth on Cape Cod one month after Stephen Hopkins received the first grant. Who knows if the Hopkinses and the Weldons knew each other previously. Gabriel's daughter Catherine Weldon married Giles Hopkins in 1639, the year after Gabriel received his grant. Possibility number three. Historians suspect that William Merrick emigrated from Wales. He arrived at Charlestown in the Massachusetts Bay Colony on the return of the James in 1636. William referred to himself as an old servant. Could he have afforded our chest? If he brought it to America on the James, he moved it to Barnstable on Cape Cod by 1642 when he married there Rebecca Tracy. Then he moved it again to Eastham, where the couple settled around 1647. We have ancestral lines to three of William and Rebecca's ten children, William, Mary, and Sarah Merrick. Contender number four. Perhaps William Merrick's in-laws brought the chest. Rebecca Tracy's father, Stephen, was originally from Great Yarmouth, Norfolk. He sailed to Plymouth Colony on the Anne in 1623. His wife, Trifosa Lee, joined him with baby Sarah Tracy in 1625 on the Jacob. The family had been living with the pilgrims in Leyden, Holland, where Stephen and Trifosa were married. Apparently, Trifosa was pregnant with Sarah when Stephen sailed to America. Upon Trifosa's arrival, the couple immediately conceived Rebecca, who was followed by Jane, Ruth and Mary, who never married, and John, who married Mary Prince, daughter of Thomas Prince, whom we will discuss in a moment. The family settled in Duxbury by 1639. Then Stephen returned to England in 1656. Number five. Perhaps Reverend John Mayo brought the chest. He was an Oxford grad and had grown up in Northampton. He migrated to Boston with his wife Tamsin and five children in 1638. He served as the first minister of Second Church Boston and as the overseer of Harvard College. He moved to Mattachies, which became Barnstable, in 1639. In 1646, the family moved to Eastham, which originally was Nauset. That was with our ancestor Thomas Prince more later. John and Tamsin's middle child, Samuel Mayo, stayed in Barnstable. His grandson, our Reverend John Mayo, ended up in Harwich, east of Yarmouth. Harwich eventually divided into two towns. The north part became Brewster. William Lupkin is the father-in-law of John's son, Samuel Mayo. All we know about him is that he was in Yarmouth by 1645. Number seven, Edmund Freeman. Two of our lines point to Mr. Freeman. He came from West Sussex. His first wife, our ancestor, Bennett Hodsell, died in 1630 after giving him seven children. In 1635, he, the children, and his wife number two, Elizabeth, sailed to Boston on the Abigail. They settled first in Saugus, which is now Lynn, then moved for short time to Duxbury in Plymouth Colony. On the 3rd of April, 1637, he and eight others received a grant to establish Sandwich with 60 lots. As the leader, he received the largest lot. Edmund and Bennett's fifth child, our John Freeman, 
was eight when he sailed with his father and stepmother to America. John married Thomas Prince's daughter, Mercy Prince, and settled in what is now Orleans. This is a picture of me back in 2009 sitting on Edmund Freeman's grave in Sandwich. Number eight, Governor Thomas Prince. Prince was a carriage maker. He came from Lakeland, Gloucester. Later he lived in All Saints Parking, London, which is also where his son-in-law, John Freeman's grandmother was from. So maybe he knew the Freemans in London. Two of Thomas Prince's daughters married two of Edmund Freeman's sons. Prince arrived to Plymouth on the Fortune in 1621, which as we said earlier, was carrying mostly men. He was 21 years old. He served as the fourth of only six governors of Plymouth Colony during its colonial days. He married as his first of four wives, Patience Brewster, the daughter of Mayflower passengers William and Mary Brewster. Patience came to Plymouth on the Anne in 1623. Prince was part of the group that founded Eastham in 1644. Six people on this family tree were named after him. My grandfather, Prince Hopkins, his uncle, Prince Levi Hopkins, his two grandfathers, Prince Hopkins and Prince Hawes, his great-grandfather, Prince Hopkins, and his great-great-grandfather, Prince Hopkins. Possibility number nine. Maybe William and Mary Brewster brought the chest. Brewster was the religious leader of the pilgrims who sailed to Plymouth on the Mayflower. He came from Nottingham and for a time studied at Cambridge, but was never ordained. He and his wife Mary, along with William Bradford, were among the original separatists who migrated to Leyden, Holland between 1608 and 1609. William and Mary sailed in 1620 with their youngest boys, Love and Wrestling. Jonathan joined them on the Fortune in 1621. The young women, our patience and fear, finally arrived on the Anne in 1623. Possibility number 10. Nicholas Snow was from St. Leonard's Shoreditch, London, which was right by where Stephen Hopkins lived for a while. Maybe they knew each other in England. Nicholas sailed to Plymouth on the Anne, arriving in 1623, as you know. In 1627, he married Stephen's daughter, Constance Hopkins. They settled in Eastham by 1645. Our ancestor, Jabez Snow, was the eighth of their twelve children. He and his wife Elizabeth married and stayed in Eastham, where they raised nine children. Number 11. Edward Doty came to Plymouth on the Mayflower as an indentured servant of Stephen Hopkins. He was about 20 years old. The likelihood of the chest being his is low, but not impossible. His wife, Faith Clark, was born in Ipswich, Suffolk, England, the same county as John Winthrop. She emigrated to Plymouth with her parents, Thurston and Faith Clark, on the Francis in 1634. If they had the chest, it was in Plymouth by the end of that year when Faith married Edward as his second wife. Their nine children were born in Plymouth. Number 11. We don't know who the immigrant was for the Morse family. Joseph Morse was living in Beverly and the Massachusetts Bay Colony by 1647. If a Morse brought the chest to America, it arrived by that time. Joseph Morse's son, Joshua Morse, married Elizabeth Doty, with whom he moved to Plymouth by 1709. Elizabeth was the granddaughter of Mayflower passenger Edward Doty, who we just mentioned. She was also the great-granddaughter of Mayflower passenger Francis Cook, through his son Jacob Cook. Jacob sailed to Plymouth with his mom and sisters on the Anne in 1623. Elizabeth Doty could have inherited the chest from either of these Mayflower ancestors. Number 12, Francis Cook. Francis sailed to Plymouth in 1620 with his teenage son, John. They left Francis's wife, Hester Mayhew, back in Leyden along with John's two-year-old brother, Jacob, and a sister or two. If Francis and John didn't transport the chest, maybe Hester and the children did, in 1623, when they sailed for Plymouth on the Anne. But would their chest have been of English design or Dutch? Jacob married Damaris Hopkins in Plymouth around 1646. It was their daughter, Elizabeth Cook, who married John Doty, mentioned earlier. Number 13. Richard Knowles, who came from Lancashire probably, and his wife, Ruth 
Bower, from someplace else in England, married in Plymouth Colony on 15 August 1639. Historians aren't certain about their parentage. If the chest came with either family, it then moved to Eastham by 1656 when Richard and Ruth's daughter Barbara was born. Richard and Ruth had at least one other child, Samuel, who married Mercy Prince, the daughter of Thomas Prince previously mentioned. Our Barbara Knowles married Thomas Mayo, the grandson of Reverend John Mayo, already discussed. They had at least 10 children. Number 14, the Godfrey family. We're not sure who the immigrant was, perhaps a guy named Francis Godfrey. The grandson, Jonathan Godfrey, was born in Eastham in 1682, so the family would have transported the chest to Cape Cod before that. Jonathan married Mercy Mayo, the great-granddaughter of Reverend John Mayo, already discussed. She and John had nine children. Number 15, Edmund Hawes is a high probability candidate. He was from London and emigrated to Plymouth in 1635. He joined our Edmund Freeman and Stephen Hopkins in settling the Sandwich and Yarmouth area of Cape Cod. Six generations later, his great times four granddaughter, Olive Hawes, married Stephen Hopkins's great times four grandson, Prince Hopkins, in Vassalboro, Maine. Olive and Prince were the parents of Charles Harris Hopkins, whose chest we have. Edmund was a well-educated man and possibly of Carolinian descent. If the chest was his, it stayed on Cape Cod until 1802, when his great times three grandson, Prince Hawes, moved it from Yarmouth to Maine. Number 16. John Gorham was from Northampton. He was possibly the man of that name who sailed to Plymouth on the Philip in 1635, because that's when we find him living in Marshfield in Plymouth Colony. He married Desire Howland in Plymouth in 1643. Desire was the daughter of Mayflower passenger John Howland. Maybe she inherited the chest from her dad. The couple had ten children, five boys and five girls. If the chest was theirs, it moved with them to Yarmouth in 1652, then to Barnstable, where John built a grist mill and died in 1675. Number 17. John Howland sailed on the Mayflower in 1620 as an indentured servant of Plymouth Colony's first governor, John Carver. Howland is famous for falling off the ship mid-ocean. As a servant, Howland probably did not own this chest. However, John Carver, not my ancestor, died the first spring and Howland inherited his belongings. Perhaps the chest was Carver's. Howland married fellow passenger Elizabeth Tilly. She had sailed with her parents, John Tilly and Joan Hurst, but they died the first winter. Elizabeth was an only child. Maybe the chest belonged to her family. John and Elizabeth settled in Plymouth, where they had ten children, six girls and four boys. Maybe the Hopkins chest lived on Martha's Vineyard Island for a short time. Nicholas Norton moved from Somerset, England to Weymouth in the Massachusetts Bay Colony by 1637. He and his wife Elizabeth had two children there. If the chest was theirs, it moved with them to Edgartown, Martha's Vineyard in 1658, which is when their son, our Isaac Norton, was 17. Nicholas had eight more children on Martha's Vineyard, totaling six girls and four boys. Isaac Norton and his wife Ruth Bays had at least two children in Edgartown. The second, our Sarah Norton, moved to today's Chatham on Cape Cod after she married our Captain Ebenezer Hawes. Maybe Isaac Norton's in-laws brought the chest. The Bays were also from Somerset. If the chest belonged to Thomas Bays, he and his wife Anna Baker shipped it to Dedham in the Massachusetts Bay Colony by 1636. Perhaps they got to know our Gabriel Weldon while they were there. Dedham was near Weymouth, where the Nortons were. Thomas and Anna then moved the chest with their six children to Martha's Vineyard before 1663 when their daughter, our Ruth Bays, married Isaac Norton. The chest would have passed on to Sarah Norton, who, as mentioned, would have taken it to Chatham on Cape Cod after her marriage to Ebenezer Hawes. Number 20. Captain William Hedge probably moved from Middleton Cheney, Northampton, when he migrated to Lynn in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. He became a freeman there in 1634 and married his first wife in 1640. 
He helped lay out the roads from Plymouth to Sandwich in 1652 and was an ensign in Yarmouth's militia by 1655. In his will, William gave his lands to his second son, our Elisha Hedge, but his dwelling, and we will assume the furniture and the chest, to his first son, Abraham. Therefore, we can probably assume that if William had a coffer such as ours, it did not pass down to Charles Harris Hopkins. Number 21. Edward Sturgis of Kent, England, resided in Charlestown, Massachusetts Bay Colony by 1634. He moved to Yarmouth by 1639. According to the author of The Great Migration Begins, Robert Charles Anderson, Edward was a very able man, highly respected in his community, but who pushed the limits of acceptable behavior and often appeared in court both plaintiff and defendant civil suits. Edward and Elizabeth had at least six children. If they had a chest, it probably went to our Mary Hedge's two older brothers. However, the oldest Edward, Mary Temperance Gorham, sister of our Desire Gorham, and Samuel married Mary Hedges, who is the sister of Mary's husband, Elisha Hedges. So the chest could have passed down through them. Another interesting possibility is number 22, the Reverend John Lothrop. He was from Eton, York, attended Oxford, then Cambridge, and graduated in 1607. If the chest was his, he brought it to Situate in the Massachusetts Bay Colony on the Griffin in 1634. He married his second wife, Anna, with whom he had seven children. John was a significant Puritan minister in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, but he quarreled with their doctrine and switched to Plymouth Colony in 1639, becoming one of Barnstable's earliest residents. If the chest was his, it probably went to his firstborn, our Barnabas Lothrop, who married Susanna Clark in 1658. Barnabas mentioned six daughters in his will, including our thankful Lothrop, who married John Hedge. I know I told you there were 22 people, but there are actually 23. I found a stray one. Thomas Clark was the father of Barnabas Lothrop's wife, Susanna. All we know about him is that he arrived at Plymouth in 1623. That means he sailed there from Leyden on the Anne or the James. If he brought the chest with him, it arrived to Plymouth three years after Stephen Hopkins did. By 1802, this family tree narrows down to two couples. Prince Hawes and Betsy Taylor moved from Yarmouth to Vassalboro in 1802. Prince Hopkins and Phoebe Morse moved there two years later in 1804. The question is, which of these couples was carrying the Hopkins chest. What we do know is that their children had a child named Charles Harris Hopkins who carried this chest to California. According to his Mayflower application, he carried it by sea. That means the chest probably went down the Atlantic, across the Isthmus by land, and up the California coast. In the next video, I'll tell you the amazing journey this chest would have taken before it got on the Mayflower if it indeed belonged to Stephen Hopkins. Well, I hope you found that interesting. And maybe you found some of your own ancestors in that list. If you did, let me know in the comments section. So I have a couple of shout outs. The first is to the Mayflower Society. They were founded in something like 1880 or whatever. And all this time they've been researching the 24 families that sailed on the Mayflower. And they started putting this information together in a series of books, which we commonly call the Silver Books, because they're silver. So it's called the Five Generations Project because they've taken each family and traced the descendants for the first five generations. These can be accessed um, at most genealogical societies, at some of the um, Mormon Family History Centers, and the Mayflower Society itself here in California, which is in Oakland. And you can also buy the books if you go to themayflowersociety.org and look in the publication section. And the second shout out is to the New England Historic and Genealogical Society. So they've also been around for over 100 years. They have a six story building in Boston on Newberry Street, packed with information about New England history. And they have a website, so you have to belong. It's kind of pricey, um, but.
but you can access all their quarterly registers for over those hundred years and any information they've published about these people. And they also have access to a recent, more recent series called The Great Migration Begins by Robert Charles Anderson. So many of the profiles that I included in this video are from that book. So I hope that helps. And to follow up from my last video, I have sent away for the will of my great grandmother, who is the one who actually gave this to my mom. And secondly, I have reached Pilgrim Hall and we're discussing whether this would be a good fit for them because I really do want to make sure it doesn't get burned up in the next California fire. All right, thanks for watching and I'll talk to you next time. If you like this video, don't forget to click the thumbs up icon below and I always love to receive your comments.